that we planned And here we'll stay Eleanor Rigby picks up the price in a church where the wedding has been Watching my dreams turning to ashes Once I can touch what my heart used to dream of You're not an angel, I'm not a queen I'm a woman that she don't need It's another hungry mouth to feed in the ghetto I don't want you, but I hate to lose you People everywhere just want to be You've heard of Lena Horne, Diane Carroll, and Eartha Kitt, but have you heard of Barbara McNair? But not too many people know about Barbara McNair. That was surrounded by a lot of mystery, a lot of scandals. I mean, people thought for the longest time that she was passing as a black woman. We're gonna get into just why they thought that and what was her response to all of this. And also, she was connected to a mobster who there's a whole crime scene that we're gonna talk about. Her husband ended up dying and people alleged that she played a role in setting it up. Her life was just full of scandals and mystery. We're gonna get into all of that and more, but first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Crane Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now let's get into this video. Despite the rumors that you may have heard or read online, Barbara McNair is a black woman with full black parents. She's not mixed or white. Look at her parents, full black parents, okay? She has had to defend herself against these type of rumors throughout her whole career. This is a direct quote from her clearing this up, stating, when I was making a lot of movies, they didn't want the woman to look too black, but black people objected to that policy, so then the industry did a reversal. It went all the way in the other direction. For the industry to limit itself to one look or another is unrealistic. Lenny Bruce used to say about me that I was a Caucasian, that someone took a paintbrush and painted me brown. White people are not aware that Negroes look all kinds of different ways. I don't want someone else's way of how I am to produce project myself as a black person forced on me, she told Jet Magazine in 1969. They used to show black people as like the Lena Horns, and she looked a lot like Lena Horn, right? I did a video for Lena Horn also, which I will link in the comment section pinned for you guys and in the end cards, but she favors her a lot, but these are the type of black women they would want on screen. You couldn't be too dark or anything like that, but black people started objecting and they started having heavy weight <laughs> in the film industry, right? We even have the black exploitation race film, which I break down a lot of starlets for their race film on this channel. Just go through my videos. Sometimes you guys make a request and I've already done a video on that person. Hollywood went left and was like, okay, let's just get really dark skinned women. Like no in between, no brown skin, no lighter skinned women. Let's just project them all as just darker skin. Like there's no flavors of the hue, right? And so it was like any woman who was light skinned at that time, even if they were not mixed and they came from full black parents, they just could not get shine and it started shifting for them and then there was a thing like it's not far-fetched for the rumors of her a black passing it's not far-fetched because there's been known and I'm doing some videos on that and I've done a couple other videos of people who are white passing or black passing before this is not new it was something that was done in the past because the black dollar started to become really, really valuable in the film industry, right? People were coming out in droves to watch these movies, whether they were white or black. And so they started seeing dollar signs and a lot of women that weren't as special, you know, like white women that didn't look too different, exotic, because you know, you had the Ivan de Carlos, the Rita Hayworth, they kind of had that exotic look to them. A lot of the women that we did, the Merle Oberons, they were really, really popular in the film industry also, even though they had these derogatory tropes for them. So if you didn't look special or exotic, then they would force you to be in order to make it. <laughs> so if Barbara was actually a white woman, to the industry and beauty standards of that time look very basic or look regular and not as interesting. So it's like, okay, well, and even Lena Horne spoke about how there was a time that they used to create makeup to darken her skin and make her appear darker in movies. And she spoke out against this. In it, they would darken her all the way up. And there was other stars that we talked about where they made makeup that it looked like skin, flesh, and all that. Y'all know Hollywood know how to create those makeups to make them look darker, but that wasn't really their color or tan them up, right? Lena Horne was one person who spoke out against that. So it's not far-fetched, guys. That's why a lot of black people 
people in that era was very suspicious of anyone who just looked like they were appropriating their culture and buying as or whether they were trying to pretend to be mixed or whatever they were very suspicious because it's there was a lot of Rachel Dolezal's <laughs> before there was social media if you know who Rachel Dolezal was so I don't want you guys to think this is such a ridiculous rumor because it was a thing that was happening especially with this whole renaissance of new black actors and creating their own movies etc and you know it becoming a popular thing to to be in film so granted she also Barbara didn't really help her cause when her likeness was used in some problematic skin bleaching ads so people was really turned off by that because they would just use her photos like publicity photos and put them on these skin bleaching ads and she wouldn't really speak about that right do you guys really think that she was passing i don't think so because look at her parents that's one and in that era i think that it would have probably benefited her because whether she was white or black she still would have been very gorgeous especially according to the beauty standards of that time she's gorgeous no matter what hue she would have been but especially if she's already this gorgeous what would her pretending to be black get her in life in that era people were actually trying to mostly pass as white so they could get successful if they were black it was so traumatizing to be a black person especially a black woman in those days that most in the community tried to either intermarry so they could have lighter babies that could pass as white with hopes of having a less terrifying experience living in this dark forsaken ignorant era and one thing she was also accused of was not liking black men because she date nothing but white men and was married to them and only her first husband i believe was black so there was also those rumors also i personally don't believe these claims because even the pearl baileys dorothy dandridge all the women we've done they had their strategic reasons why they did that to further their career just like black men was doing if a white person was getting too much backlash they would start to affiliate and associate themselves with black people befriend them or date them so it was a vice versa thing okay it worked out for everyone to be more global than to be more leaning towards one direction when it comes to the industry. She also faced vicious rumors that she was a pass around and slept her way to the top to get gigs and bookings. She was the first black woman to have her own variety show. Instead of giving her her credit for accomplishing this great feat, the rumor mill would not end. People linked her to Dean Martin, Elvis Presley, Barry Gordy, and more. But in fact, Barbara was a hard worker. Barbara worked her way up from typist to singer of small supper clubs to headlining large showrooms as one of America's more visible singers of the late 50s and 60s. So I don't believe none of these rumors. But before we get into all of the rest of the scandal, let's get into her childhood real quick. And unfortunately, there aren't baby photos out there of her or anything like that. But on a chilly day in March 4th, 1934, in the bustling city of Chicago, Illinois, a star was born to Horace and Claudia McNair. This starlet, who would go on to dazzle audiences with her vocal prowess, was one of five children in the McNair family. It was here, under the loving encouragement of her parents, that McNair discovered her passion for singing. Her parents, Horace and Claudia McNair, believed in her abilities, planting in her mind the concept that she was superior to most, and even better, a star. She found her voice in school plays and during the harmonious hymns of church services. Much to the delight of those around her, her education continued at Washington Park High School, where she donned the cap and gown in 1952. Post high school, McNair's quest for knowledge led her to the American Conservatory of Music. There she immersed herself in the study of music, developing her skills and nurturing her talent. However, her educational journey didn't stop there. McNair also spent a brief period at UCLA, firmly believing in the notion instilled in her that college was a necessary stepping stone towards achieving any life goal. However, after a year at UCLA, McNair had epiphany. She realized that the traditional route of education didn't align with her aspirations. The college curriculum she felt wasn't offering her the tools needed to achieve her dreams. So she made the daring decision to drop out, choosing instead to carve her own path towards success. This was her golden ticket to performances at prestigious venues like the Purple Onion and the famed Coconut Grove. The New York Times labeled her as a radiant beauty, possessing a warm, engaging personality and a versatile voice that could deliver passionately intense ballads or touch the fringes of gospel. She swiftly rose to popularity, becoming a sought after performer at top tier venues and a frequent guest star on popular television shows such as The Steve Allen Show, 
Hula Baloo, The Bell Telephone Hour, and The Hollywood Palace. Her enchanting voice resulted in hit records while recording for renowned labels such as Coral Signature, Motown, and Recording Studios, with notable tracks including You're Gonna Love My Baby. In 1967, she went on a heartwarming journey to Southeast Asia alongside Bob Hope, performing for U.S. troops during the Vietnam War. Her acting career kicked off on the small screen, featuring in popular series like Dr. Kildare, The Eleventh Hour, I Spy, Mission Impossible, Hogan's heroes and Macmillan and wife. McNair made headlines in 1968 when she posed Bear for Playboy and starred in a bold role in the crime drama If He Hollers, Let Him Go. Her acting credits also included a role alongside Mary Tyler Moore in Change of Habit, Elvis Presley's least feature film, and playing Sidney Poitier's wife and They Call Me Mr. Tibbs in its sequel to Organization. On Broadway, McNair shown in productions like The Body Beautiful, No Strings, and a revival of The Pajama Game. McNair broke barriers with her own television variety series, The Barbara McNair Show, being one of the first black women to host such a show. The program featured a star-studded guest list, including Tony Bennett, Sonny and Cher, Little Richard, and many more. McNair was a headliner at Las Vegas hotels like the Sahara and frequented TV game shows in the 60s and 70s, including You Don't Say, Hollywood Squares, and The Match Game. In the late 70s, McNair was part of the original Four Girls Four Act. With all of this success, you would think things were smooth sailing for her, but no. During her career, Barbara experienced racism from time to time. When she appeared in No Strings, a musical by Richard Rogers, set in Paris in which a black fashion model falls in love with a white novelist, she endured obscene phone calls and hate mails from both sides of the spectrum. She once walked out of a hotel in Miami that offered her a room but forbade her to swim in the hotel pool. A few times, she was forced to eat in the employees' dining room and hotels at which she was performing because blacks weren't allowed to eat in the main dining room. Now let's get into her scandalous relationship with the mobster okay now McNair was married five times and had no children but let's focus on her most interesting marriage which was a wild story so buckle up in the scandal-ridden autumn of 1972, the sultry songstress Barbara McNair found herself in a dangerous situation that would make even the most seasoned tabloid writers heart race. The setting was none other than the Playboy Club in New Jersey. It was what locals like to call a notorious hub of high society hedonism. Police out of nowhere came rushing in with full force. The charge, possession of heroin. A crime as shocking as it was unexpected for McNair's fans because she had a squeaky clean personality. The drama unfolded when McNair innocently signed for a package delivered to her home. Unknown to her, the parcel concealed an enormous cargo of narcotics. McNair declared her ignorance about the package illicit contents and the mystery of the sender remained as mysterious as a Hitchcock plot. In a twist of fate, it was McNair's then-husband, Rick Manzi, a man with a reputation as murky as a foggy Chicago night, who was ultimately charged with the crime. By April 1973, the curtain fell on this dramatic episode, with all the charges against McNair being dropped like a hot potato. However, the storm didn't end there for McNair. This incident brought her career to a standstill. She stated in an interview that you can spend all this time building something and it can be destroyed in a minute, she says, and snaps her finger. Commercials were taken out from under me. She snaps her finger again. Television specials were canceled. She snapped her fingers again. But guys, things got worse. On December 15th, 1976, tragedy struck like a bolt from the blue. McNair's husband, Rick Manzi, a Chicago businessman with rumored ties to the underworld, was brutally, you know, taken out of here inside of the gilded walls of their Las Vegas mansion. Manzi was found clad only in a t-shirt and he had been shot several times and lay dead for four to six hours. Officers found no signs of forced entry, struggle, or burglary, and all the doors and windows were locked. The distraught McNair on her way to a flight to Las Vegas appeared not to have known of his manner of death, saying she had thought her husband died as a result of some kind of illness. The plot thickened when Mafia boss turned FBI informant Jimmy Fratiano spilled the beans in his tell-all book, The Last Mafioso. He claimed that Manzi wasn't just a businessman, but a Mafia associate. Allegedly, Manzi had attempted to put a contract on the life of a mob-associated tax attorney over a legal dispute. As the saying goes, when you play with fire, rumors had it that McNair knew about all of this but still decided to stay. Was it because she was afraid? Maybe, maybe not. Either way, their marriage came to a dramatic end with his untimely death, and for Manzi, the trial to his murder has stayed cold for 39 years. But there's more. 
Rumors are that maybe she played a hand in the demise of her husband based on the fact that Barbara brought Rick's mother with her to her Chicago gig right before Rick was taken out of here, right? And although Rick was supposed to meet them there and also is suspicious because her brother Horace, who lived with them, left out of the house that day at 4 a.m. to quote unquote buy groceries and he left the front door unlocked. And according to rumors, it's likely Barbara and her brother knew Rick was going to be taken out of here and it was all a setup. All of these, of course, are alleged and just rumors. Barbara or Rick is no longer here to speak on it, so we will never know. And you know, when someone dies in a circumstance like that, a lot of stuff come up and she was very protective of her career. So I don't know, you don't know people, but me personally, I don't think so. What do you guys think? Comment your thoughts below. McNair filed for bankruptcy in September, 1987 with debts totaling equivalent to $1.2 million today. Into her 70s, she resided in a Los Angeles area, playing tennis and skiing to keep in shape and touring on occasion. McNair passed away on February 4th, 2007 after a seven year battle with throat cancer in Los Angeles. This is all I have for this video. I am curious to see what are your thoughts, okay? I don't know her favorite color, so just leave a heart in the comment section if you watch until the end of any color. But do you guys think she has something to do with her husband? I don't think so. And do you guys think that she was black passing? I don't think so. Well, I, I can say definitely not looking at her parents. And as she got older, she definitely did get a little bit more darker. She was lighter when she was younger. But as she got older, you could really see this was a black woman. So I don't think so. I think that was ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> but I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until the very end, comment below who else would you guys like to see. And check out all of my other videos that I've done so far. You never know who you might request that I've already done. I love you guys so much. Until next time.